We all know the life on Earth depends on photosynthesis, but I'm willing to bet there's a whole lot about it that you don't know. Photosynthesis is the process that converts 100 terawatts of sunlight energy and 200 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year into the food that powers the planet and the energy we need, whether in form of berry photosynthesis like this or the petrol that you put in your car. But this amazing life-giving process is hopelessly inefficient. About 75% of the light that hits this field of crops is lost because it's outside the range of colours that chlorophyll absorbs, like green light, or it's reflected or lost as heat. Then, a further 20% is lost due to inefficiencies in plant metabolism, such as when they accidentally consume oxygen instead of carbon dioxide, a wasteful process known as photorespiration. Only about 5% of the sunlight that hits this field ends up in these grains. And don't get me wrong, plants have done amazingly well on that 5%, becoming the dominant life forms on Earth. But if we're to meet the central challenges of the 21st century, and produce enough food and energy to sustain a world population of 10 billion by 2050, we're going to need to help them improve on that figure substantially. Behind these doors is the university's controlled environment center where we can grow plants under a range of different climate conditions to test which factors are most important in improving the efficiency of photosynthesis and understanding how that translates into yield. But given that plants have had about a billion years head start on us, why haven't they already evolved photosynthesis to be more efficient? The thing is, and this is really crucial to understand, Plants have different priorities from us, so where we place most importance on the parts of the plant that we eat, like leaves, fruit from a tomato plant, or the grains from a wheat plant, plants place more importance on growing and reproducing into the next generation. Once you understand this, you can begin to build an approach for improving the efficiency of photosynthesis. The light intensity for these leaves is constantly changing. Sometimes that's due to variable cloud cover, and sometimes it's due to dynamic movements of neighboring plants as they move around in the breeze. But as the intensity of sunlight changes, so the balance between solar energy input and CO2 conversion must be tweaked to maintain the maximum efficiency of photosynthesis. Failure to do so will result in damage to the leaf, just as we can be damaged by the sun if we fail to take proper precautions. Hello Sarah. Hi. Tell me a bit about what you've got going on here. So I'm taking measurements of chlorophyll fluorescence from these plants to see how photosynthesis is lagging behind the changes in light intensity. It gives me a readout as this graph. So what do these peaks and troughs mean? If these curves were square, that would mean that photosynthesis was perfectly in sync with the changes in light intensity. I can tell you that these plants are very far from that. Okay, so 100% efficiency is presumably impossible, but what could we do to improve their response slightly? So our research has identified the protein components which are important for this process so that we can use genetic engineering to increase their levels and make the switch happen faster. The dramatic increase in food production required by our growing population means that we're not going to be able to wait around for evolution to sort it out for us. That's why approaches like genetic engineering are so important for improving crops like this apple tree. So where do we go from here? Increasing our levels of food production isn't the only problem we face, and it isn't the only solution either. Undoubtedly, the best response would be a reduction in our overall level of food, resource, and energy consumption, married to a decrease in the amount of waste we produce. We at the University of Sheffield are playing a key part in this global shift towards sustainability.